Good afternoon. I am Mark Hansen, founding director of Interfaith at Augsburg, an institute to promote interreligious leadership on campus, in our local communities, and far beyond. On behalf of Interfaith at Augsburg, I welcome you to this forum. In so many ways, Chris Stedman, our speaker today, embodies why Augsburg, as a university rooted in the Lutheran intellectual tradition, has made enhancing interfaith leadership on campus and nationally a priority in Augsburg's new strategic plan. In his book, Faithiest, How Can an Atheist, How an Atheist Found Common Ground with the Religious, Chris describes how important his years as an Augsburg student were to that journey. While an Augsburg student, Chris was a Christensen and a Sabo scholar. In 2018, he received Augsburg's first decade award. This semester, he's teaching in Augsburg's Department of Religion and Philosophy. Chris holds an MA degree in religion from Meadville Lombard Theological School at the University of Chicago and was awarded the Billings Prize for Most Outstanding Scholastic Achievement. Augsburg University is committed to creating neighborhoods, a society, and a public square where religious diversity is a constructive force serving the common good. Again, Chris Stedman embodies that commitment. He did so as the founding director at the Yale Humanist Community and fellow at Yale University and as humanist chaplain at Harvard University. Chris exemplifies Augsburg's commitment to public leadership, appearing on CNN, MSNBC, PBS, and through articles in The Guardian, The Atlantic, BuzzFeed, The Vice, USA Today, and Washington Post. In his just published book, IRL, Finding Realness, Meaning, and Belonging in Our Digital Lives, Chris brings together his remarkable gifts as scholar, analyst of contemporary culture, person with insatiable curiosity about life, relationships, and meaning, together with his openness in sharing his own humanity and vulnerabilities. I highly commend this book to you. Finally, a personal word, Chris, thank you for the ways that you listen to me with such empathy and encouragement and share with me what I consider the bonds of friendship. The title of Chris's lecture today is, What Can We Learn About Being Human from Life Online? Following his presentation, Professor Dr. Lori Hale, Chair of Augsburg's Department of Religion and Philosophy, will moderate a conversation with Chris you may use the Q&A feature to share your questions. Welcome, Chris. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's so nice to be with you all today and very special to me personally to be doing this event for the book at Augsburg. Um, for so many reasons, Augsburg holds a very special place in my heart. Um, I've been very fortunate that my path has intersected with Augsburg in so many different ways um, at so many different points over the years. Um, and I, I absolutely credit um, any, <laughs> any curiosity that I may have um, or any of the other very generous things you said in your introduction, Mark. Um, I credit a great deal of that to the years I spent at Augsburg and, and to the years I continue to spend there now in, in new roles. Um, I'm super excited for the conversation we're going to have today. I want to, um, I'm going to share some remarks about the book. Um, I, I want to be careful not to go too long because I want to leave time for conversation um, over the years of having many opportunities to travel around and speak about my first book. One of the things that I enjoyed most um, about that was all of the sort of rich conversations that would emerge after um, I was done <laughs> doing my part. And so I, I want to leave plenty of time for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a little bit about how this book came to be and why I wrote it. And then I'm going to share five key kind of takeaways from the book. And then from there, we'll move into conversation. So I moved back to Minnesota after a number of years away um, in 2017. Um, right as I was sort of beginning work on this book. And two things happened that led me to writing the book that I ended up writing, which was not the book that I thought I was going to write when I started. 
Um, the first was that during that that period of time that sort of led up to the move back to Minnesota, and and as soon as I got here, um, I was going through a period of great sort of transition in my life. Um, the work I'd been doing as a humanist chaplain and an interfaith activist was sort of coming to an end, at least in that particular way. Obviously, I've continued to um, draw on a lot of the work that I was doing at that point, but my doing it in a sort of professional capacity, at, at least for the moment, that was coming to an end. My I was I'd been in a long term relationship that was ending. I had spent uh, most of my twenties living on the other side of the country, away from my family, who all stayed here in Minnesota. And in coming back, I was sort of, um, in some ways, I felt like I was, the, there was the end of that chapter of this sort of independent life I had had off on my own. And so in all of these ways, I was going through um, this sort of tumultuous time of, of change and transition. But I noticed that on social media, where I spent a great deal of my time and my life, um, and that was a huge part of my career as a, as a community builder, as a writer, um, I found that I, I was posting online as if it was sort of business as usual. So even though in my personal life, my life offline, I was um, experiencing all this change and 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 difficulty online, um, anyone who I was interacting with online would have been sort of largely none the wiser. And so I was feeling this kind of split between who I was online and who I was offline. And I wanted to understand that split, um, why it was that I felt like there were certain things that maybe I, I couldn't or shouldn't share online, even though so much of my life really was happening online and a lot of meaningful things were happening online. And so I, I wanted to investigate that. And then the second reason is a little bit more connected to my, my career, my professional work, which is that for the better part of a decade, I worked as a humanist chaplain, supporting specifically religiously unaffiliated students and broader community members who participated in the programs that I directed. And so the focus of my work was primarily accompanying people who fell outside of traditional religious categories as they worked to make sense of their lives, find a sense of meaning, a sense of place in the world. And um, as some of you may know, that one of the sort of largest demographic shifts in this country right now in the United States is um, this shift of people who are leaving religious institutions and saying that they no longer identify themselves as religious. It's the fastest growing segment of the religious landscape and now makes up uh, about a fourth of all Americans and a third of people under the age of 30. So it's especially, um, it's rising especially quickly among younger people. And one thing that I noticed was that a lot of the people I was working with who no longer considered themselves religious were doing a lot of the things that we've historically done in religious spaces online. They were turning to the internet to find a sense of community, a sense of belonging, to make sense of their lives and understand the world around them. Um, and specifically, I, I was beginning to work with a couple of sociologists to do this sort of comprehensive study on the lives of religious Ameri of, uh, religiously unaffiliated Americans. And so that was one of the things we started looking at was the role of the internet in um, as this space where people are making meaning, finding a sense of belonging and so on. Um, and the reason I wanted to understand this better is that, um, you know, religious traditions um, have existed for a long time with the exception of obviously of new religious movements. Um, but many of the religious traditions that people um, turn to, to make sense of their lives and to find a sense of identity and belonging um, have developed over a long period of time. And so um, they, they have rituals, practices, norms um, that are well established, whereas the internet is so new. And um, the ways that we use it to understand ourselves, to connect with others around us, um, are things that we not, haven't necessarily thought about that well, um, or at least I hadn't, which I think is a big part of why I was feeling so split personally. Um, so I spent the last few years investigating that split, and I ended up looking in all kinds of unexpected places. I spent a lot of time just across the river at the University of Minnesota's MAP library and talking with the um, director of the Mapping Prejudice Project at the University of Minnesota, 
who, uh, so the Mapping Prejudice Project, for those who don't know, is a community-led effort to map racial covenants that were put in the deeds of properties here in Minnesota, um, specifying that um, black and brown people could not reside at those properties. And uh, actually, I was referred to the Mapping Prejudice Project by Augsburg history professor Michael Lansing. Um, and they, um, by working with them and, and talking with the people at the map library, I was able to use maps as a way of trying to understand the ways that we map our lives online and all of the sort of invisible um, conventions that guide those choices, just as um, you know, many people might not have been aware that there were racial covenants put in the properties of deeds in Minnesota and how that shaped the demographic neighbor, uh, makeup of the neighborhoods in Minneapolis, St. Paul. There are often norms and conventions online that um, shape how we understand ourselves that many of us aren't aware of. And so I think oftentimes um, when we think about the internet and the way that it's affecting how we understand ourselves, especially this year in a time when so, many, so much of our lives have moved online very quickly, um, it's easy to sort of listen to the voices um, that offer the sort of most extreme perspectives. Of course, this is something we see in religion all the time as well, um, or in the ways that people talk about religion. So, you know, we hear people say, um, offer all kinds of doom and gloom about the internet, that it's destroying our ability to connect, that it's making us more polarized and isolated and lonelier. And then we hear the sort of utopians who say the internet is making us more human, more efficient, more connected than ever before. And I think in many ways, um, both of those sort of ultimately fall apart, those ways of seeing, you know, the internet as sort of universally good or universally bad. Um, and then there's this kind of third category of people in the middle who are utilitarian about it, who say the internet's here to stay, it's not going anywhere, and so we should learn to sort of make the best of it. But I found myself, I, I started sort of more cynical um, and in part because I was feeling sort of split. Um, and then I think I moved toward a more utilitarian approach. But in the end, I landed in a kind of fourth category, which is uh, a group that I think um, the perspective that I ended up sort of landing on is, yes, a, a kind of utilitarian approach to the internet saying, you know, we, we should try to sort of learn how to use it better um, in ways that make us feel more human rather than less. But I also think that the internet presents us with a new opportunity to reapproach some sort of age old questions about what it means to be a person, um, what it means to find meaning and belonging and look at them in new ways. Um, and, and over the course of working on this book, I think I, I came across some things that at least felt sort of like useful insights for me um, into this, this question of what it means to be human. So before we, break out into uh, a conversation, which I'm super excited for. I want to share just five um, sort of takeaways that were things that I, I sort of came across while working on this book. Mm -hmm. So the first is, is sort of connected to what I was just saying, which is um, that the internet is so new. And because it's so new, we're really bad at, at using it to be human right now. Um, it, it, I was reminded a lot while sort of investigating how the internet affects the way that we understand what it means to be human and, and reflecting on my own digital habits. I, I thought a lot about an experience I had in high school where my mom said I had to go out for a sport and I protested because prior to that, I'd really stuck to the activities that I was, I was naturally good at. Um, so academics, uh, stuff like that. My siblings were athletic. That was their thing, not mine. Um, but uh, so she was insistent. So I went out for cross country because I was a horrible runner and especially bad at distance running. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to go for out for the sport I'm worst at. Um, of course, what I didn't realize at the time was that everyone makes a team in cross country. So uh, I ended up uh, sabotaging myself there. Um, but my mom really encouraged me to sort of give it a chance and, and try it. And I ended up discovering two things. First, I actually loved running and I still run to this day. I find it to be a really helpful practice for me. Um, but also I learned or I discovered that you learn fundamentally different things about yourself when you do something that you're not good at um, rather than the things that you're sort of naturally good at. 
that that process of, of having to work your way through something that doesn't come naturally to you, something that you are not good at, um, actually gives you many opportunities to learn important things about yourself, about the world around you. And I think life online is kind of like that. I think online, because we're not good at being human online yet, because it's so new, we actually have many opportunities in that newness to try things that don't work, to make fools of ourselves, to learn through these sort of inelegant attempts at being human in these new ways. So that's, that's kind of the first thing is, um, I think online, um, I talk in the book about the difference between sort of deep play and shallow play. So, uh, you know, we all experience shallow play online. It's like a, um, a slot machine. You sort of keep going back, pulling the lever, hoping, you know, for the, the dopamine rush of, of a feeling of connection, just as you're sort of clicking and scrolling. I think many of us over the last couple of weeks, were doing a lot of mindless scrolling kind of shallow play, but in deep play, we have an opportunity to experiment, to try things. It's, it's like the sort of imagination games I played with my siblings as a kid, where we created characters, we connected with each other, we developed stories. And I think even though sometimes online, it's easy to kind of mindlessly be bad at the internet, we can also mindfully be bad at the internet and learn from that kind of experimenting and trial and error. The second thing, um, the second kind of takeaway I got is that is connected to something I said earlier when I was talking about the Mapping Prejudice Project, which is um, many people today are leaving institutions in which we've sort of historically wrestled with questions about what it means to be human, like religious institutions, but um, this is certainly exists outside of religion too. We're seeing kind of this mass shift um, culturally away from institutions, um, be they political, religious, civic, and um, people are, are, are sort of becoming less likely to identify themselves with an institution. But what I think happens is for many of us, we sort of tell ourselves, okay, I'm leaving an institution and I'm sort of forging my own way, go, taking my own path. But actually, for many of us, what we've done is swap one institution for another, because even if we think we're sort of transferring the work that has happened within religious spaces, whether we're non-religious or we're religious and just not participating in religious community as much, um, really what we've done is transferred that work from one institution to the other, to another, because the internet is itself a kind of institution with norms and conventions that shape how we use it. Um, and, and these unseen rules of the internet, they typically reflect the interests of the people who, who build them. And so, um, you know, with the internet, it's because it's not truly a public space. Um, our social media platforms that we use to find community and express ourselves are, are run by private companies that are sort of guided, not necessarily by the common good, by, by, but by what makes them money, um, what keeps us scrolling, the often shallow play that we engage in online. Um, you know, it, that sort of creates an obstacle um, to us feeling more human online. And so, I think if we're not honest and aware about the fact that the internet is this sort of institution with its own norms that aren't always um, ones that are sort of operating in in our own best interests, uh, then it's it's impossible to to use the internet more mindfully if we can't sort of at least recognize that that fact first. So I think that's a, that's. And at the end of IRL, I actually sort of say that I think that's the biggest obstacle right now um, is the kind of profit-driven structure of these platforms. I don't think that the, our fate is set yet. Um, there was a really helpful study that I cite in the book that came out of BYU. It was an eight-year longitudinal study, which means that um, over the course of eight years, they studied the same people um, over a long period of time. And they found that two people could use the internet for the exact same amount of time and have very different experiences of the internet. Um, so this kind of challenges this common line of thinking that the internet makes us lonelier, more disconnected, um, more anxious, et cetera. But what they found was that the difference sort of came down to whether someone was using it mindfully in a kind of deep play way, reflecting on what they were using the internet for and why or if they were using it sort of mindlessly. And I think it's much easier to be mindless in our use if we're not honest about what the internet is. Um, and, and so I think when I was feeling split at the beginning of this process, it was because I was being less mindful about 
how and why I was using the internet for these really big pieces of what it means to be human. The third takeaway is that I think that digital life shows us the inherent contradictions in being human. So when I say that the internet gives us a chance to sort of reapproach age old questions and understand ourselves better, I often think about um, this one specifically. Um, some people refer to the internet as a kind of funhouse mirror in the sense that it, it sort of distorts or warps certain things while revealing others. And I think that um, the distortions are super clear to us, um, but the, the revelations are important too. Um, you know, when it comes to what it means to be a real person, I think that, you know, throughout human history, we've always been multiple selves. Um, the person that I am right now in this uh, session is not the exact same person that I am when I'm talking with my mom or my best friends or um, my students. Uh, and, and, and I think sometimes when we are confronted with that reality, it's easy to react against it and say, well, one of those must be the true me and all others are sort of fake versions or, or less real versions of me. But the reality is we've always been a composite of many different selves. Um, that's always been true. Um, and it's not that one of them is more real and others are less real. It's just that um, who we are is someone who is made up of all of these different selves. But the challenge is that online, we're expected to be one person for all these different groups. So what I post online needs to be acceptable to all these different groups, to my mom, to my students, to everyone. And that can make it easy to feel like you're walking a tightrope. And I think when we, when we recognize this tension, we react often in one of two ways. We either sort of simplify ourselves um, for very understandable reasons, because there's consequences to kind of contradicting this um, coherent self that you're supposed to have. Um, and we, we just present the sort of safest version of ourselves online. But I also think that we can choose another direction. We can choose to use the internet as an opportunity to recognize that this has always been true, that we've always been complex, contradictory people. That's not a bug. That's a, it's a feature. It's part of what it means to be a person. Um, and I think by calling into question the very idea of what it means to be real, life online gives us a chance to explore the complexity of realness in a new way. Um, and, and I think that can be really freeing. Um, but the, the question is whether or not we'll sort of embrace that opportunity. The fourth takeaway is sort of builds on that, which is that I think that our digital attempts to find meaning and connection often reveal that life is fundamentally uncertain. And I think that's felt really true this year, um, at least for me. Uh, you know, oftentimes the utopians of the internet promise us a, a kind of... A, a certainty that feels almost impossible. You know, we can have all these apps and uh, Apple watches that give us our heart rates and all these different things. But no matter how many apps we use, we can't optimize our way out of uncertainty. We can't be, we can't somehow reach a level of efficiency that will rid our lives of uncertainty. Life will always find ways to surprise and, and disrupt um, as certainly has been true this year. Um, and I think when we sort of mindlessly use the internet, um, you know, it's easy to use these digital tools to try and feel safe and secure and certain, um, you know, when, when logging on is less a sort of set apart activity and more just a, woven into every part of our lives all the time. It's easy at, at the first moment of, of feeling uncertain of feeling disconnected to um, grab your phone and, and try and find a, a feeling of connection to sort of pull that, that lever on the slot machine. But I think that, and that, again, that's not to say that life online and the connections we forge there aren't real, but rather that we also need moments where we can be truly by ourselves. Um, we need the perspective that we gain from from disconnecting. Um, I use in IRL the Velveteen Rabbit as a kind of touch point story. It was one of my favorite stories as a kid. Um, and it's all about this toy rabbit that wants to become real. And um, the story ultimately, um, without giving the whole plot away, um, ultimately the sort of takeaway from the story is that it's in, in love being loved that the rabbit becomes real, but also it's not just in that connection, it's also in disconnection because the rabbit loses the, the boy that owns the rabbit, uh, the toy. And, and likewise, I think 
in a time when connection is sort of the norm, when we're always plugged in, we're always on our phones, um, we need to be really intentional about taking time to step away, not because life online is fake, but because we need space in our lives for the kinds of questions that can only arise in uncertainty, only when we're by ourselves. And I think when we use our digital tools, honestly, um, you know, that's it, or it's easier to do that when we've taken that sort of opportunity to step back and then return to them. In the final months of working on IRL, um, I took a three month social media sabbatical and at first it was horrible and then it was awesome. And the reason it was awesome, the reason I felt more at peace, more relaxed is because I it's like I was on a kind of retreat. I was disconnected from other people's realities, from the difficulties of others in the world. Um, but I ultimately, what it means to be me is to be engaged with the world, to be concerned. And so I ultimately can't stay in retreat if that's what I want. And so there's, it's not that there's anything wrong with taking time to retreat. I think that's really important, but it, I think it serves a purpose if it gives us to, uh, uh, insights that we can take as when we return um, to being connected. And I think that the ways we use social media, both when trying to resist uncertainty and trying to accept it, um, can help open us up to life's unknowns and, and to understanding and, and accepting them more. Which this leads me to the fifth and final sort of takeaway I want to share right now, which is um, I have to <laughs> I have to end. Um, with a, a Lutheran adjacent <laughs> piece, uh, not only because I um, am doing this event at Augsburg, which is a Lutheran affiliated institution, and not only because I teach in the religion department at Augsburg, a Lutheran affiliated institution, but also because I studied religion at Augsburg, a Lutheran affiliated <laughs> institution, and, um, and my understanding of the world and the way that I think about my understanding of who I am, my sense of vocation, my responsibility to the world around me, though I'm not Lutheran, it's very much shaped by um, my, what I've learned from the Lutheran tradition. Um, and, and I'm very excited to talk uh, with Dr. Lori Hale, Lori Brand Hale, um, my former advisor and now a colleague in the Department of Religion and Philosophy, um, because uh, Lori is a um, a scholar of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And while I'm not a scholar of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I've been very influenced by um, Bonhoeffer specifically because uh, I've been influenced by Laurie. And um, one of my favorite Bonhoeffer um, ideas is, uh, you know, this, he, he talks the, um, so for those of you who don't know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian in Germany um, at the time of the rise of Hitler. And um, he talked about, um, or he made this argument that Christians should live as if there is no God. Um, and, and what he meant by that, and actually Laurie can probably explain this better than I could and maybe correct me if I don't get it exactly right. But um, what he meant by that is that uh, Christians should work to discern God's will and then act on, on God's behalf in the world. So not expect God to sort of intervene in the face of injustice um, and act, but, but rather to see it as their responsibility as Christians to act in the world um, on, God, in God's, on God's behalf. So for him, that meant participating in a conspiracy to um, attempt to assassinate Hitler, which I think is a great example of, um, of uh, someone really working to do difficult discernment in a really important time in history. And this might seem like a strange thing to bring up uh, when talking about the internet, but I thought about that a lot while working on this book, because I think the debate about how real life online is, is going to rage on for some time. I don't think that my book definitively resolves the debate. Um, I do think personally that we can, that I, I don't think it serves us to, um, to say that life online is fake. And I think there's all kinds of evidence that very real and important things happen online. But even if I haven't convinced you of that today, um, or don't convince you by the end of the book, I think the, and the reason I thought about Bonhoeffer a lot is I think we should treat life online as if it is real, um, as if it is as real as any other part of our lives. Um, and by that, I mean, I think we should work to bring the same values that we try to practice in other parts of our lives, the same kind of self-awareness and reflection that we try to apply to every other part of our life to the internet. Because I think it's really easy um, and, and, 
and very understandable. We all kind of ingrain this uh, or absorb this idea. And it's so deeply ingrained that the internet is, isn't real or that the things we do online are somehow sort of less real. Um, and I think that makes it easy to not try to bring our values to the internet. But I also think we do ourselves a huge disservice when we do that because we don't treat this huge part of our lives as an, as sort of ripe for us to sort of look at it and understand things about ourselves and the world around us in the process. And I have to say that over the last few years of doing this investigation into digital life, I learned so much about myself just from looking at my own digital behaviors, um, which I think sort of circles back to my first point, which are my first kind of takeaway, which is I think that we have, there are so many ways that we can look at what we do online, these sort of messy, inelegant ways of trying to figure out what it means to be human online. We can look at all that and, and see really important things about ourselves. Um, you know, it's not as if this desire to present a kind of coherent um, or, or edited self to the world is new. I mean, we've always done that. I, I think I make the joke in the book that, you know, um, about the family Christmas letter that doesn't mention dad's DUI. Um, you know, we've always kind of presented a more palatable self to the world. But I think in the ways that we try to, um, that we struggle with what we should share or shouldn't share online, the kind of struggle that ultimately started the process of this book for me, I think in that struggle, we have so many opportunities to learn things about who we are. And so sometimes I can look at, um, you know, maybe someone tweets something rude at me and I respond in a snarky way, um, you know, rather than trying to sort of deny that and say, that's not real, you know, life online is fake. And, and that's, so that doesn't really count or, um, that's not really, uh, yeah. Um, instead I can look at that and say, well, what does this show me about myself? And I think that when we cleave off the internet as being kind of not a real part of our lives, um, we lose the opportunity to do that. Um, and so the last thing I want to say before we transition into conversation is that, you know, we're in a moment of immense cultural transition right now, shifting from a pre-digital age to a digital one. Um, and that's, you know, that shift has been sort of kicked into high gear this year. Um, but I think that th those kinds of immense cultural shifts, um, one of which we're living through right now, are often really difficult. And there's a, there is a lot of loss that happens in those. Um, this is a, I, I'm going to really simplify how I talk about this, but, um, you know, when the printing press was introduced, um, that was a huge cultural shift um, in terms of the way that knowledge was transmitted. And there was a lot that we gained from that. This book wouldn't exist without print, <laughs> printing press being introduced. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, there was also loss and it was messy. Um, Initially, who had access to the printing press, who decided what got printed, people in positions of power. It wasn't this immediately universalizing force. And there was also loss because prior to that, um, you know, there was uh, more of the sort of oral transmission of knowledge and what, you know, transmitting knowledge orally facilitates certain kinds of relationships that aren't facilitated in the same way when you're reading um, text on a page. And so it's true right now as we transition from a pre-digital to a digital age that we're losing things and, um, and that, you know, and, and transition is, is difficult. Um, that swirl of change and loss, um, is, it's stressful, it's hard. Um, but I also think that so much is gained and learned in those moments of transition. When I look at the moments in my life when I've learned the most about myself, about the world, about my sense of vocation and place in the world, it's often in those sort of moments of transition, whether it's a few years ago when I was starting work on this book and so much of my life was changing, or the years I spent at Augsburg when so much of my understanding of the world around me, my sense of, of religious identity, uh, my sense of vocation, all of that was really shifting in that time. And those periods are, are difficult. And I think that, you know, we need to be honest about the fact that we're in a difficult moment right now. But I also think that in those difficult moments, we have so many opportunities to come back to these questions that we have wrestled with from the beginning of time um, about who we are, what our responsibility is to one another. And I think treating the internet as if it's real will help us get one step closer to trying to answer some of those questions. So 
I hope this uh, talk has helped given you a little bit to think about in that regard. And I'm super excited for the conversation to follow. Thanks. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, it's just, it's so delightful um, to welcome you to this conversation at, at Augsburg in our digital ways that we're doing things now. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so just from, on a personal note, thank you. I um, I think we have shifted roles a little bit. So uh, once upon a time, I was the teacher and you were the student, and I, I feel like those roles have reversed. And so I'm extremely grateful uh, for the chance to, um, to to learn from you in, in, in this conversation and in, in our friendship and in our other um, conversations. Um, so th yeah, so I'll just, I'll start briefly with the, um, the, the Bonhoeffer, uh, the Bonhoeffer I, I, I figured I should have known. It's like, it's sort of like bait that I dangled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now how can I resist? No, I think, I mean, I really appreciate the way you read Bonhoeffer and the, um, you know, that he does write explicitly about vocation as responsibility. Um, and it's a sort of super deep, thick conversation or concept that we can have a lot of conversation about. Um, but ultimately he says that we have to, live as Christian for him, he's coming from a Christian point of view, but as Christians for him, we have to live unreservedly in this life, in our responsibilities, in our duties, in our sorrows and our joys. And it's super messy. And so I think um, he has, he is a good conversation partner for this work you're doing about what it's like to navigate these, um, these lines, these, uh, um, this sort of uh, the in between, you know, our digital and our not digital lives, and 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 so I appreciate the way that you've thought about that, and I appreciate um, just the sort of the through line in your book uh, around this concept of liminality or the in between or transition, and and the ways that those times in particular um, are both difficult and fruitful. Um, and that, you know, and that, that can be hard work. So I, you know, I would like to, there are some questions coming in, which I will, would like to get to, but I would like to, um, I would actually just like to ask two questions myself. Um, uh, and so one of them is actually another connection to Bonhoeffer, uh, maybe a little bit uh, indirect, um, but you were, you were talking about sort of the need to connect and disconnect. And on the final pages of your book, you talk about the need for time alone and time together. Um, you talked about your, your social media retreat or sabbatical. Um, that actually resonates for me with Bonhoeffer's uh, work in life together. Um, you were referencing his, his, the, the things you were talking about come from his uh, letters and papers from prison. But in life together, he's talking about the need to be um, able to be alone and to be in community. And I wondered if, if that had any resonance with you and if, if there's something about the way to navigate um, our digital lives. It is something of a spiritual discipline. Would you say it like that? I do. I mean, I think like, you know, the internet, I came of age at a time where I, I, I sort of had this in-between experience where the internet was not a part of my sort of earliest years. And then it sort of was introduced into my life. And I remember having to bike to the library and log onto the shared computer for 20 minutes at a time before the timer would run out. And, you know, so I, I don't have the same experience that some that people growing up today have many, um, not everybody to be sure. Um, where the internet's sort of a part of how they come to understand themselves. Um, but as the internet became more and more a part of my life, um, and it sort of snuck up on me, um, I, I think I, I wasn't really even aware until I took a step back from it to sort of recognize, I wasn't aware how much I was using it, but you know, the internet really appealed to me because um, I, I think for many years, I felt like the, you know, the, the way that I most was able to come to understand myself was through connection, by being understood by somebody else, by seeing, myself reflected in someone and also coming to understand someone who is different from me. And I, I, I think I often tried to sort of run away from the time alone um, because it's in those moments of, I, I remember growing up, you know, without a smartphone, I didn't have a smartphone until I was in my twenties. And, and I remember periods of time of being truly disconnected, waiting for a bus or something and having nothing with me to distract me. And in those moments when you're truly by yourself, um, un really uncomfortable thoughts can arise. The types of 
you know, recognitions in, in yourself or questions that maybe you, you don't want to wrestle with the things you want to avoid. And, and so, you know, I spent much of my time, um, in my twenties, just surrounding myself with other people, finding connection online, um, in part because I felt that it was in connection that I could be known and know others. But also I think on a level I was less aware of because I was uncomfortable with the practice of being alone and um, with confronting the, the kinds of uncertainties and questions that arise when you're truly by yourself. And so I do think that um, there are sort of two spiritual practices for um, you know, whatever we want to make of that term. <laughs> um, when it comes to life online, there's the practice of using the internet in a more mindful, careful, thoughtful way but there's also the practice of disconnecting. And I, I refer to it in the book as a, a kind of velveteen habit, um, uh, playing off of the velveteen rabbit. Um, because, you know, I've come to recognize that it's, that there's a huge value and, and need really to carve out space in your life for those uncomfortable, you know, moments of, of solitude. And as I've gotten more comfortable with that, I've actually come to discover a love of spending time alone that I never would have thought I would have, would have. Um, and that's, that's a part of myself that I need to tend to as well. Um, and in this sort of digital moment, it is a practice. And, and I think I describe it as such at the end of the book, I say it's, you know, it's less, uh, less about following 10 simple steps to optimize your digital life and more about entering into a kind of a way of being, um, a way of, of practicing um, disconnection and connection. Um, thanks. Um, I'm actually going to uh, hold my second question because we have quite a few questions coming into the um, chat now. So um, there's a question from a student, uh, an anonymous student, uh, saying, what advice would you give about how to remedy exhaustion in the context of online schooling? All of my classes are online, and I'm trying to find a way that make it that makes that more bearable. Yeah. That's such a good question. And honestly, um, I mean, one thing that I try to be really clear about in IRL is that like, um, I'm not an expert on this stuff. I'm very much trying to sort of figure it out myself. And, and I think that there are two, well, there's many kinds of writing, but there's two kinds of writing. There's the kind of writing where this person is like, I'm an expert and I'm going to tell you all these things that I know, which I think there's real value in that. Um, but then there's, writing where the author is a kind of um, companion with you as they're trying to figure out their way through something that they don't understand. And that's the kind of writing usually that I, I do and the kind of writing I'm often really drawn to. And so in this book, I'm trying to figure that out myself. And, and I don't at the end come to this you know, feeling of having it totally figured out. These questions are still very live for me and they've taken on a new dimension this year in particular. Um, I do think that, you know, um, and every, I realize I'm, I'm suggesting something to you that, um, you know, different, different people are going to have different views on. And, but I think, I think you need to be able to, and it's hard to do, um, but you need to be able to establish boundaries when, when you need them. Um, and this is a hard thing for me. I'm a, um, you know, I, I, um, fulfill many Minnesota stereotypes. And one of them is that I have a really hard time saying no to things. And so, I get asked to do lots of things all the time. And my default is to say yes. And I, I talk in the book about learning to say no. Um, and I, it was such a hard lesson for me that I actually got the word no tattooed on me um, <laughs> to kind of try and affirm for myself the importance of that. And I think this year, especially in a time when, you know, so much of what we're doing is happening in front of a screen, um, it is really important to give yourself permission um, in moments to not do everything, um, and not get it all done. Um, I've had to learn how to accept, you know, that sometimes I have so many things to do in a day that I really can't do them all. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that I failed. Um, it means that I'm also prioritizing taking care of myself. And, um, and so, I think right now we're trying to figure out how to do this, how to do school virtually, um, you know, really quickly and, and, and we're all doing it, um, imperfectly. And I've tried in my class with my students. Um, and, uh, if any of my students are here right now, you're welcome to tell me, uh, if I'm not doing this well, but I really try in my class to, 
um, be very upfront about the fact that I'm figuring this out at the same time that they are and that we're all in this together. And I want them to be honest with me about whether or not it's working, whether or not um, they're feeling overextended. And so I guess I would just encourage you to, to, you know, in those moments to give yourself permission to take a step back when you need to, but also to communicate with your, with your professors, with your um, advisors, uh, let people know what's going on. Um, I think odds are that they will understand because they themselves are feeling similarly. Um, at, at least I hope, I hope they will. I hope they give you that grace. Thank you. Um, on a, um, uh, pulling back to more of a 10,000 foot level, there's a question, there's a couple of questions coming in from other, from faculty members. So um, Professor Pike in the sociology department is curious to know, has sociology informed your understanding of self and reality? Yeah, um, like I, I think I mentioned at one point in the talk, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I had the opportunity over the last few years to work with a couple of really incredible sociologists on this um, survey uh, into the lives of religiously unaffiliated people. But furthermore, um, you know, so that definitely shaped um, my approach to the book. But furthermore, one of I, I, um, I put my book through a really intense um, editing process and want the sort of most intense round of edits was I had a group of 10 readers from many different disciplines read through the manuscript and give feedback. And one of those readers, um, which is also someone I, I, who is also someone I was talking to just while working on the book throughout is a sociologist and ha was also one of the people giving the most feedback <laughs> in that round and also pointed me in the direction of so many resources while working um, on the book. And so um, I definitely... Um, you know, I, I tried to draw on as many different sources and get as many different perspectives as I could because I knew that my perspective on this was going to be necessarily limited by the way that I think about and approach these things. But um, definitely um, the field of sociology and in particular um, the sociologists that I've been working with through the last few, over the last few years played an immense role in helping me um, think through this question of of what it means to be real in this specifically in this digital moment um, in a really invaluable way. Um, and, and my hope is that that, um, that comes through in the book in the kinds of sources that I draw on and, and things that I reference. Fantastic. Um, there is one uh, very simple um, question. Somebody wanted uh, asked to have the, uh, the book, to see the book. Oh, sure. <laughs> so it's called, it's IRL, uh, finding uh, realness, meaning and belonging in our digital lives. So here's, here's what the book looks like. Thank um, you, Laura. <laughs> um, another student question has come in and, um, and, and she, uh, Thanks you first, first of all, and then says you br briefly touched on this when you talked about responding to a mean comment, but what do you say about people who choose to use the internet to fuel hate and misinformation? Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really important and really difficult question. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a piece for Vice on um, the alt-right and the ways that the alt-right specifically um, targets and tries to sort of bring in and recruit people who are disconnected, um, who don't have a strong sense of community, a strong sense of identity. So in particular, young white men who have disaffiliated from a religious institution um, and who are looking for a sense of belonging, and they really sort of um, prey on that vulnerability um, to, to draw them in. Um, and one of the ways that this happens is through the kind of gateways um, that exist. So you watch one YouTube video and then you sort of are sent gradually down this kind of rabbit hole of misinformation um, that, that gradually radicalizes people. And, um, and I, I think this kind of comes back to uh, the, 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 the fundamental challenge presented by a profit-driven internet right now um, in the sense that, again, these, these platforms um, don't really care what kind of experience we're having online. They just care that we're online. And if what drives engagement easiest, easier than anything else is, is, is sort of inflammatory content, then that's the stuff that the algorithm will prioritize. And so I think that the way that we, um, we address that is through systemic transformation. Um, I, I, I make the parallel 
in the book to climate change, um, where, you know, I can recycle all I want and I should, but, um, me recycling might change my experience of the world, but it's not going to ultimately change things on a sort of systemic level. And likewise, you know, I can be more mindful and careful about the way I use the internet. I can try to, um, you know, be aware of the algorithms and the way that they work and, um, and all of these things. But until there is transformation on a systemic level, my own individual choices are not going to have the kind of impact that is needed. And so I think when it comes to, um, you know, it's, it's easy to look at the internet as a, a, a kind of dumpster fire. People will sometimes put it that way. Um, but if the internet's a dumpster fire, it's partly because, um, <laughs> we are a dumpster fire <laughs> as a, as a species. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're, uh, doomed to be a dumpster fire. We can, we can take steps as, a, as a collective to try to, um, create systems that help move us in better directions. And I think that for many people, religion has functioned in that way for many years. And religion gives people an opportunity to have a space that challenges them to reflect on how they're living and whether or not it's consistent with the values that they have, that holds them accountable to the values that they articulate. Um, at, you know, my, my mom um, goes to church, uh, even though she doesn't consider herself a Christian. And, and part of why she does, uh, she's told me, is that it's a, a weekly sort of check-in and a reminder that she's trying to live a certain way. Um, and she finds that after she goes to church, she's more likely to do things that she wants to do, but that are maybe harder for her to do that in her sort of day-to-day -day life she neglects to do, or you know, she makes more selfish choices or those sorts of things. And I think that right now the infrastructure of the internet is not one that moves us in the direction of trying to be more mindful and more careful. And so we can make our own individual changes. And I've found as I've become more honest and self-reflective about how I use the internet, that's helped me. But again, I think we need systems, we need rituals, we need um, structure to help us uh, move in that direction. And, and so I think systemic transformation is, is the answer. Thanks. Um, there are a couple of questions um, I'm going to um, ask together. They're related. They're about the writing process, actually. So um, one person has asked, uh, what inspired you to write your book and who was your best influence while getting it started? And another person has asked, as a writer, what advice would you give students at Augsburg who are looking to find both motivation uh, to write and also maybe make connections in Minneapolis? So maybe you can yeah. address those together. So for the second one, I'd say, if you haven't taken a class that meets your search for meaning to requirement, I am teaching two sections of religion <laughs> 200 in the spring. <laughs> and um, the way that I, one of the things we do in that class is um, writing projects that explore the connection between our experiences and our sense of vocation and what we believe about the world and look at other stories and the way that other people have done that. So if you're looking for a motivation that will get you writing, um, that I, <laughs> shameless plug for my own class. <laughs> um, but I also, um, I have to say that other writers definitely, um, you know, I talked about having this group of people who gave me feedback and input on the book. Um, and you know, many of them were writers and we read each other's work and support each other. So find, you know, find other people around you who, um, you know, you, you feel inspired by what they're writing and, and you can sort of, um, you know, help support each other. Um, I also definitely always give a shout out to my agent, um, who's based here in Minneapolis, actually, his name's Eric Kane and he, um, co-established, a an, an agency, uh, he played a super important role early in the book because I was trying to write, ultimately, this was a really different book in the beginning in many ways, as I said earlier, but one of them was that I was kind of trying to write it similarly to my first book, which was very much a kind of chronological memoir of, you know, here are some events of my life and in, in sort of the order that they happen. And I was trying to write this book that way. But it wasn't working, and part of that was because this was a, a different book. Um, and you know, and my agent really he took a look at my earliest pages and he said, you know, I think you're trying to write it this one way, but actually, I, what I'm seeing, and you know, I was actually orienting the book around these images, and I was just trying to fit it into this other way of writing. And so, um, the other thing I would say there is that you know, it's very helpful um, to have people who, and this comes back to the the sort of 
the value I think that religious communities often play for people is that they are this community that can help you see yourself and understand yourself and maybe see things in yourself that you don't always want to see or that you can't recognize. And again, I think the internet can do that. Um, but I think we have to be intentional about seeking out those groups of people. And for me as a writer, that's been essential, um, is finding people who, um, can help me see things in what I'm writing that maybe I'm not aware of because I'm trying to do things in the way I've done them before. Um, or, I, you know, I need someone else to come in and look at it and offer me another point of view. Um, so those are a couple of things I would suggest for sure. Thanks, um, Chris. So I'm going to uh, ask you one more question there. Unfortunately, there are more questions in the chat than we're going to have time for. We just have a few minutes left. And this is actually kind of a big question, uh, given the short amount of time left. But I think it's a nice, because I'm just warning you, but it's a nice way to maybe... Um, uh, do one more takeaway. So, um, and this comes from Professor Green in the English department. What are one or two of the big realizations you've had through online life during this moment of liminality, which includes the pandemic and racial injustice and political division? Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, first, I finished this book uh, in December of last year. And I've had the question a number of times from people, of, you know, like, did you change anything given everything that's happened this year? Um, anyone who understands the publishing, the way that publishing timelines work, that really wasn't possible. But also, you know, I feel grateful that I think the book does speak to the moment just as it is. But um, I, I've, I do feel like in this year where so much of life had to move online really quickly, I, I felt really grateful because I feel like I was able to, I spent the last four years really learning from so many people. I did so many interviews and so much research for this book. And I was able to learn a lot about how to sort of be more mindful online. And then I was able to kind of test it this year by, by necessity. And I found that the way that I experienced life online really um, was different this year in, in large part because of everything that I learned from the people I talked to. Um, and, and, you know, I, I live just a few blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. And, um, you know, that happened at a time when so much of life was happening online. And yet it was the internet that, you know, I, that helped me find out about what was happening in my neighborhood that helped me connect with, um, the uprising and what was going on so that I could be there physically, um, but also engage with people digitally. And so that felt like this real reminder of how real online life online is. And then, you know, the last thing I'll say, um, knowing how little time we have, um, is that, you know, uh, if anyone, anyone who follows me on social media knows that my dog was a huge part of my life, a big part of what I shared online. Um, and she died very unexpectedly this summer. And, um, I had shared so much of her online when she was alive that after she died, um, I wasn't sure whether or not I should say anything, but I ultimately felt like I should because I had shared so much of her and just that outpouring of um, support and love from people after that happened just felt like such a, a validation to me because um, even though so many of them were people who had never met her before, um, they felt connected to her. They felt connected to me. They were mourning at the same time that I was, and it made me feel so much more connected, more less alone in what I was experiencing. And it just felt like this huge affirmation of the fact that, um, and, I, and I think this year, in all of its difficulty, um, in all the ways that life online has felt really frustrating and challenging in moments. I've also seen so many ways, um, whether it's through the uprising ha that happened in my neighborhood and the ways that the internet helped me connect with that, or the way that the internet grieved with me when my dog died and supported me in that, or the way that I've been able to have conversations like this or um, teach and connect with my students over the internet. Um, I just, I've, I, I feel like, as I said, I, I didn't reach figuring it all out at the end of the book, but I did reach a, a sort of conviction to um, try to sort of keep working at it. And I feel like this year has been a real opportunity to put into practice so much of what the many amazing people who shared their insights with me over the years of working on this book, what they gifted me. So I feel really grateful for that. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, 
Chris, uh, he won't do this, I don't think, but I will promote his website, which is chrisdedmanwriter.com. So if you want more information about um, either of his books or any of the other things that he has worked on, you can find information there. And um, I, uh, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And, and thank you, Laurie.